You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Okay, we are live, but we got to let it breathe just a moment as we bring on Facebook, and then we will officially get this gut reaction going, and we're good. So welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up podcast, presented as always by Mile High Huddle, powered by Blue Wire Pods. I'm your host, Chad Jensen, and with me is my fellow football priest. He is the deputy editor of MileHighHuddle.com, Zach Kelberman. Zach, in a somewhat bizarre turn of events, after standing up at the podium last night and telling everybody that the, the competition continues to rage on, it was uh, reported, I can't remember now off the top of my head who broke it, Ian Rappaport or Adam Schefter, Schefter. that the Denver Broncos have uh, chosen Teddy Bridgewater to be the starting quarterback. So Teddy has vanquished Drew Locke off the snap. Your gut reaction. <sighs> I am so torn because we called this, you know, we've predicted this for days now. It seemed very evident coming out of the Seahawks game that Vic Fangio needed that to just confirm his own bias in favor of Teddy Bridgewater and nominate him the starter. And going through the charade yesterday of still saying it's close and they might both play on Saturday and it's no decisions imminent yet. He knew all along, Chad, he's probably known for days, if not weeks, if not months that Teddy Bridgewater is his guy. So I'm not surprised I, when they made that trade, the, the familiarity with George Payton, him being kind of a safe guy for Fangio's defense, him being more of a Fangio quarterback than Drew Locke. Not surprised at all. I really do feel bad, and you guys can say what you want now that the competition's officially over. I still feel very, very badly for Drew Locke, and if you guys watch him at the podium tonight, big time kudos for him getting up there and taking really tough questions at a very vulnerable time in his career and his life. Uh, but I don't think it was a fair shake. People th- you know, think the Drew Locke era, he had his chance. The Drew Locke era ended last year. What chance did he have as a rookie when he played in five games and won four of them? What chance did he have last year when it was a pandemic-ruined year? There was injuries ravaging the Broncos' offense, uh, his own injuries he dealt with, poor offensive line play, poor play calling. He never got a full opportunity, a full season as a starter in the NFL. I feel terrible for him in that sense, Chad, but I'm also – Moving forward, mentally, emotionally, with the Broncos quarterback, that is Teddy Bridgewater now, I still think, and I've been saying for a while since they acquired him, they can win with Teddy. It won't be as flashy as Drew. It won't be as exciting. It may not be as high scoring, but he'll keep them in games and let Fangio's defense do the rest. I'm not deviating off my prediction for the season. I still think they can win 9, 10 games, make a push for the playoffs but I'm really disappointed that Drew Locke didn't get his chance when it seemed so evident coming out of the Vikings game with how good he looked that we were going to see what he could do this year. Yeah, yep. I mean, listening to Fangio today and then a few of the other players, what really jumped out to me, what kind of dawned on me, is that it wasn't – we've been weighing so much of how this is going to shake out on the preseason performances. And obviously they played a big role, but what I perhaps undersold a little bit, or maybe not so much undersold, but didn't fully appreciate was some of the finer details and nuances that have been going on behind the scenes. And I'm not even talking about practice. I'm talking about meeting rooms. You know, I'm talking about Teddy Bridgewater when he was in Minnesota with, with the Broncos uh, a week and a half ago, calling up Garrett Bowles and saying, hey, let's go to dinner tonight, taking Garrett Bowles out. Bowles said tonight after uh, practice that that was the first time uh, one of his quarterbacks had ever just straight up like invited him to dinner like that. So Teddy, before the jump, so as soon as Teddy probably, in fact, we know this, before Teddy even landed in Denver, before Teddy even knew for sure the trade was going to happen, he was in research mode. He was checking with people. He was finding out things like, Nate, how many kids does this guy have? What school did he go to? What are his kids' names, as we heard from Garrett Bowles today? And so I think over, what was it, Zach, end of April up until this point, Teddy Bridgewater has been campaigning in a very um, passive way. And I think it's just who he is. Um, I don't I don't mean so much like he's out there like trying to sell anybody, but 
just being Teddy, he's he's campaigned in the hearts and minds of his teammates, and he's he, I think he really has won them over. I think at this stage, the little small nuances from breaking down film in the quarterback room to his relationship with the guys, and then that coming out in the wash as far as his execution on the field and whatnot, I think the coaches felt like because they – postured this sack as a true open competition. I think they felt like they couldn't do anything but choose Teddy in this moment because of all the little things he had done to basically win the locker room and the trust of the coaches. Now, does it make it the right decision per se? I still don't like it in my gut, but like you, it's like, hey man, look, Drew had his shot couldn't quite capitalize, couldn't quite, he showed improvement, but he couldn't quite close the deal, right? Couldn't quite get it done. Teddy's the guy. Now it's time to move forward. You talk about campaigning with his teammates and campaigning with Broncos country and campaigning in the community. Really only one person he had to convince, and that was Vic Fangio. And make no mistake about it, guys, this was a Vic Fangio call. Not Elway, not Peyton, not Pat Shermer. This is a Vic Fangio purely made decision from a Vic Fangio uh, concocted quarterback competition. And I believe he wanted Teddy Bridgewater all along. But this is a guy who's coaching for his life in Denver. He is on the hot seat. He is as lame duck as they come. He wants a quarterback that's going to keep him in games. This is a guy who admittedly, and I caught some flack about this on Twitter as usual, this is a guy who doesn't prefer to watch the Broncos offense live. He wants to watch them on film. I, I mean, this is a guy who's admitted that he'd rather play not to lose and, and settle for field goals when he can and play a hard-nosed, ground-and-pound, defensive, slug him out type of game. And what quarterback fits that bill that's Teddy Bridgewater so I I always go with the the ceiling over the floor and you can always do it in reverse if you get if you give the guy with the ceiling a chance and doesn't work out you bring the guy with the floor and that's the whole point of having a floor but if you start with the floor it doesn't work the other way and now I feel like Drew Locke's confidence in Denver is shot irreparably and it should be I mean not just as an NFL quarterback or as a quarterback in general but how could you have faith in this organization that they'll ever do right by you when they've honestly I don't know I impeded his progress I would say at every turn starting with the firing of Rich Gangarello as his coordinator that he was working so well with the downfall came when Vic Fangio 60 year old defensive mind brought in 58 year old Pat Shermer and then once they got together and that bond formed I feel like they wanted to go for a steadier quarterback a more veteran quarterback in came Teddy Bridgewater out goes Drew Locke we all saw this coming it doesn't make it sting any less, though, for the, those of us who wanted your lock to start. I saw it coming as a distinct probability, right? But at the same time, from a rational perspective, as I've listed on this podcast for months now, ever since Teddy landed here, the Broncos still, in my book, had more reason to err on the side of Drew uh, and then let the chips fall than rolling with Teddy out of the gates. Because you can always go to Teddy, as I've said a million times on this podcast. Teddy's on the, his fifth team as a pro. He's been a backup. Guys in the locker room understand that. And you could have always said, hey, look, Drew's been our guy. We saw the improvement. He, we saw that he has taken steps forward. It's not like he went out in the preseason games and just you know stepped on as you know what. We've seen that. So we're going to err on the side of Drew being our, our guy that we drafted, the incumbent, the young guy. And then behind closed doors, knowing and maybe even saying to the, some of the leaders, if there were questions in the locker room, hey, you know, we can always go to Teddy. And it would have been Drew's on a short leash anyway. So, hey, you know, but you can't really reverse engineer that. Now they're saying Drew's handling it like a boss and that he's going to embrace his role as a uh, as a backup and all that. But the quarterback confidence thing, and it's not just Zach, quarterback confidence is a nebulous thing, right? And it's a intangible thing. You can't really reach out and touch it. It's, it's it exists in the ether, right? And once it, is gone or s significantly um, wounded. It's hard to get that back. And in Drew's case, it's one thing to go out and, for example, throw a pick. It's one thing to go out and have a losing season. It's another thing to go from feeling like you have the full faith and support of the organization to being told, sit down, next guy, you're, you're done. You're not that guy for us anymore. And losing that, it's like giving up the ghost in many ways and as I've said many times on this pod, 
it's about a 50-50 proposition whether or not a young quarterback who's gone from being the presumptive guy and the presumptive future franchise quarterback to being sat down and, and like permanently sat down. I mean, I say permanently in that he's the starter, Teddy. And as Fangio said today, we hope he plays all year as our starter. It's hard to get that toothpaste back in the tube. In fact, it's very rare that that even a portion of that toothpaste can be squoze or suck back up into the tube. So that's the biggest thing to me that I wonder. It's like, hey, man, you always could have gone to Teddy, and now you're never going to know what you could have had in Drew, who obviously has some pretty unique talent. It's tough sometimes to get the toothpaste out of the tube, let alone getting it back in the tube, Chad. You know, so and the thing with Locke, you know, you were talking about it, it's one thing if he went out this preseason, this training camp, this offseason, OTAs, mini camp, and he looked like Paxton Lynch 2.0. He looked like he had no clue what was going on. He looked like he either had no growth or even inexplicably took a step backward. That's not the case, though. What more could he have done this offseason to improve and show uh, that he deserves at least a, a fairer opportunity? in the quarterback competition from being the first one in the building, working with Peyton Manning, changing the technical aspects of his game, working you know year round since in the offseason, coming in and developing a rapport with the guy they brought in to replace them, Teddy Bridgewater. Um, and not only that, coming out in the first preseason game, knowing that his head coach said publicly, we're judging this competition by preseason games. Okay, he comes out week one, 80-yard touchdown pass. He's looking like a quarterback reborn. And let me tell you something, guys. Everyone talks about, I made this point before, but it's more apt right now. Everyone talks about the fact that Locke never created tangible separation from from Teddy Bridgewater, and that was expected of him. But the opposite, the inverse, was never discussed This entire time that Bridgewater never blew away an erratic quarterback with only 18, 19 starts, whatever it is under his belt. Teddy Bridgewater has 58 and this quarterback competition was that close to call where it was even Steven up until August 25th. Why is that never talked about? How is that not an indictment on Teddy Bridgewater? And somehow it's an indictment on Drew Locke that there was no clear separation. If you watch that Minnesota game, there was clear separation. And if you watch that Seattle game, one quarterback played better. But did you, did anyone out there come out saying, okay, no no lie, real deal, Teddy Bridgewater is night and day better than Drew Locke. I've seen enough. I find that hard to believe. He made a a couple nice throws, Chad, but none of that arm talent like Drew Locke has, none of the explosion – now, I don't know that the Broncos are looking for that. Maybe they're not. Maybe they don't want that. Maybe they no. want to go forward on fourth and one and third and one. They want to kick field goals. They want to have Royce Freeman be their leading pass catcher. Maybe that's all by design. And if that's the case, it adds more credence to the argument that Vic Fangio and Pat Shermer need to go. You didn't have the right coaching staff, A, to develop Drew after you fired Rich Scangarello. And that's really, I mean, that's the biggest thing is you had vision in the front office when Elway was, you know, calling the shots as far as, you know, he's a former big toolsy quarterback himself, right? John Elway. And so he saw that, recognized some of that game in Drew. You had the belief there. And I think the pieces could have been there. I think you could have still seen Drew succeed with a, you know, defensive minded, you know, uh, curmudgeon type head coach like Vic Fangio. But when they had Skangs hit the hit the bricks and brought in Shermer, that just hasn't proven to be a very good fit. Now, guys, we got a lot to get to. We're going to continue reacting. Let's catch up real quick, Zach, on some matters of business, including a few supers. Tom El Greco up there in Canada. The chat jumped your your uh, super a long time ago, so I'm reverse engineering it and I have to read part of it off camera. But here is what Tom said, and thank you, Tom. He says personal agendas like Shermer and Fangio, really bothers me. Fangio quoted yesterday, we can win with both guys, so why not Drew? Well, uh, we'll never know, I guess. Should have named Locke at the start of camp, guys. Uh, And then also we got Max Power. And again, thank you, my friend. We got Max Power saying, I'm thrilled for Teddy. He's got a couple here, so I'm going to read them off, off camera. Thrilled for Teddy. His play in the games set him apart, but the leadership and his humble attitude took him over the edge. I'm looking forward to... I'm looking forward to competent QB play plus accurate passes for the first time in years. Go Broncos and then his second super. Thanks again, Max. In my opinion, they should cut Drew Locke and let him go elsewhere. This is Teddy's team now. Don't need noise from fans calling for Drew if Teddy throws a pick and Ripping can be the backup. So, Zach, 
What's your what's your take to that notion? And then we'll do a quick update on Facebook. My take is if Drew Locke was named the starter, you won't, wouldn't want to be advocating to cut Teddy Bridgewater. You wouldn't care if Drew Locke was getting you know uh, called out after a bad game and there'd be chance, or you wouldn't worry about having anyone look over his shoulder. That's the difference there. When with it's Teddy Bridgewater getting the nod now, you want him to be the unvarnished understood starting quarterback, nothing in the way of competition, never looking over his shoulder. And how is that going to treat you? You're, you're tying your, sta- your your wagon, you're hitching your star to a quarterback that's on his fifth team now that's been replaced by Sam Darnold and, and been replaced everywhere he's gone. And I understand you can support that, but it has to work both ways. And to advocate to cut Drew Locke, why cut him? Why not at least keep him around or at the very minimum trade him? But see, this is, the, this is again... Even though the competition's over, the LDS will always remain, Chad. I mean, as long as Drew Locke's in the conversation, he's trash. Quick update on where we're at with our goals on Facebook real quick, you guys. Uh, We have inched closer to our goal of getting to 250 supporters on Facebook. We're at 110, so we're 44% uh, complete. Shout out to those of you who have pulled the trigger, paid the 5 bucks a month, because that gets you access to our premium VIP podcast content which includes kelberman's corner on sundays broncos book club with your boy on saturdays and the trickle zone on saturdays so thank you guys and then as far as where we're at zach we're at 66 percent to our our goal of 500,000 stars on on facebook when we reach this game we're going to raffle off a von miller jersey plus a very special unique mhh thank you to the winner plus a few little runner-up prizes to the top five people that, that finish in the top five in stars all right the only people in the running to win this jersey in the raffle are those who have contributed to the goal. And as you can see, we're at 66%. And fortunately, Facebook, <clears throat> pardon me, helps us keep track of who those people are that contributed to the goal. And here is how it's shaping up, Zach, entering tonight's stream. And then throughout the stream, we'll, we'll do as many updates as we can to let you guys know where tonight's stream is at as far as the leaderboard. But we got Zeus McPeak at number one. Love you, Zeus. Andrew Lampy at number two. Wow, Andrew Lampy has has made some strides there. Travis Weber at three. Randy Jones at four. Howie freaking day has risen up the freaking board, Zach, over the last few weeks. So props to you, my friend. Michael Ronquillo there at six. Really cool to see. Travis Tarbox at seven. Sean Miller at eight. Gary Leeds Palmer at nine. The legend. Andrew Baker at ten. And then guys like Simon, Claude, Butch, Pete. And Brian Bowman, Shane Daniels, I mean, you guys are just outside the the top 10. So why does it matter? Well, the more stars that someone has contributed to the goal, the more tickets that you're going to have in the hat. So that just means you improve your odds of winning the prize. And you're also supporting us here at MHH. So thank you, guys. Uh, Zach, instead of going through matters of business, I'm going to jump straight here to – I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it this way real quick here. Uh, This super chat from Clayton Merrick. All right. Now he has a few here. So let me actually, as I'm flashing his, his profile on the screen, let me actually back up to the first one. And here's what he says, Zach. I feel like we just squandered young talent. What was the point of passing on Justin Fields? <laughs> Trigger warning. I personally thought it was to give Locke another chance. I guess not. Then he says, what's bugging me is the fact that he needed Teddy three fourth down conversions to move the ball against Seattle's second stream defense. I wish the Broncos would have put Locke in the second quarter with the ones and see what he can do because Fangio is on the hot seat. We could be missing out on a long-term quarterback, a franchise quarterback. Again, coach gets to decide a franchise's fate long-term due to him being on the hot seat. I wish George Payton would have stepped up and then he ends with, okay, I'm done venting now. Go Teddy. So Zach, your, your thoughts on, on the fact that, And this is something we've heard a lot on Twitter today, right, Zach? A lot of people have come at me. If we were going to go with Drew, why did we pass on Justin Fields at pick nine? Uh, Speaking of coming at me, uh, Esteban, let me just say, no, you wouldn't. I I promise you, you would not. You can say that behind a monitor. I guarantee you would not. Thank you for watching me, though, as always. In terms of Justin Fields, it is a trigger warning. I think Broncos country, regardless, should let the Bears focus on Fields and let Denver focus on Drew Locke and now Teddy Bridgewater as their starter. And I don't think they pa- they didn't pass on Fields because of the quarterback that they had, either Locke or Bridgewater. It was not Locke versus Fields or Bridgewater versus Fields. It was Fields versus Patrick Sertan. 
And George Payton, I mean, you can knock him all you want, but he had conviction where he wanted Sertan in that spot and not Justin Fields. That was his call. In terms of Payton stepping in and undermining Fangio, how could he do that? Why would you, as a rookie general manager, you brought back the incumbent with the understanding, more than likely we have the coordinator and head coach returning, let them pick the quarterback, I'll bring in the veterans to leave it up to you, Peyton's in a honeymoon season, you can't undermine your head coach, you can't undermine your team, and I don't think Peyton wants that responsibility. I think he wants to be, for the most part, at least this year, what he was in Minnesota. A little more behind the scenes, the scouting guy, uh, the player personnel guy, building the roster up, but that's why you have a coaching staff. Unfortunately, the coach in charge of picking the quarterback is an old school defensive mind who admittedly does not watch the offense practice live. That's where the problem lies, Chad. And you were spot on when you said it's just not the right coaching staff for Drew Locke. It's the right coaching staff for Teddy Bridgewater or maybe like a Case Keenum, Alex Smith, not for Drew Locke. That was Scangarello. And the moment they fired Scangarello was the moment the Drew Locke era hit a downturn. Andy Cowhick, thank you for the super chat, buddy. And thanks for everyone's patience tonight. It's going to be a very hot chat. We're going to do the best to get to everyone we possibly can tonight. Uh, But here is what Andy says. He says, Fangio is an old school coach surrounded by an old school staff. Him picking the perceived steady vet over the young, talented, but inconsistent gunslinger should surprise nobody. I believe both will play this year. Hashtag Denver Broncos for life. And Zach, that's something that I know Luke has been saying, Luke Patterson has been saying for a while now, hey, it doesn't really matter. Not so much it doesn't matter, but for those who might be upset that it wasn't Drew or if it would have gone the other way around, you're going to end up seeing both guys at some point this year anyway. And the fact that they added an additional game to the schedule only kind of bolsters that argument. I'm not sure it's exactly true. I don't have the stats in front of me of how many quarterbacks who started the season finished the season without missing time. But, you know, it's it's not easy to do, but it happens. You know, Tom Brady didn't miss time. Peyton Manning, the only time he missed was his final year in Denver. So, you know, most of the time they find a way unless it's truly a, you know, uh, like the Drew injury in Pittsburgh in week two, where it's the throwing shoulder he had to sit down. Well, maybe this is my ignorance, but did Bridgewater miss a lot of time in Carolina last year? He did miss a little time. I think it was one game. I think I he mean, missed that's... one start. Okay, so wait, wait. If Drew Locke missed a start, you guys call him injury prone, but Teddy Bridgewater missed a start? I mean, I can play this card all day because it's the truth, and the locked arrangement is still ongoing. I saw a comment in the side chat that said, go Team Teddy. This is not Team Teddy like it wasn't Team Drew. This is Team Broncos. And now Chad and I and every other person that supported Locke will support Teddy Bridgewater because he's the Broncos starting quarterback. But the divisiveness in Broncos country, it's like the political landscape right now, Chad. It's left versus right. It's whoever you're supporting. Meanwhile, we're all living in the same country, though. We're all covering or rooting for the same team. So it's team Broncos, not team quarterback. Please, guys, let's get on that path. Yeah, he did miss for what it's worth. He missed the... Week 11 game against Detroit, which the Panthers did win in a shutout victory uh, with that knee. But he also said when he landed here, Teddy Bridgewater, that the knee injury he suffered last year down the stretch, he played through it. In fact, when the Broncos drew him on the schedule in week 14 uh, and the Broncos trucked him and then, you know, he put up some garbage time stats to make the final score look a little closer. But he said he shouldn't have been playing like he probably should have just sat down, you know, so he did get hurt. Teddy is, I mean, even if you take out of the equation, Zach, his uh, knee injury, that really scary one from back in 2016, you know, he's a relatively thin guy, right? And he's kind of got, let's just say he doesn't have the thickest of legs. So I worry a little bit about his below the waist stuff, but he's at least the, the thing that helps him out, Zach, is that he's a smart enough quarterback to evade the pressure, sense it, feel it, outsmart the, the pressure before it gets to him. It's a matter of what I worry more with him are non-contact type of scenarios. And then here's Dave from Georgia. What's up, brother? Good to see you. He says, okay, the decision has been made. I was hoping Drew would be the choice, but Teddy is a capable quarterback. Indeed, as I've said since he landed here, Teddy's no joke. If Teddy starts every game this year, I hope he shatters all his previous work. Let him hate with the fives. (laughs) Um, Here's the thing with Teddy. Zach, if the stars were ever going to align for Teddy to – have a renaissance and kind of cash in on what his former hype and pedigree was before the injury in Minnesota and before he ended up being a journeyman. If the stars were ever going to align, it's right now. 
not only because he just won the job, but because this team is stacked, dude. And I, I'm not just talking about, oh, you've got a good defense and a couple of good running backs. Those two things are true, but you've got arguably, if you're Teddy, I mean, I know New Orleans, that those five games, he's six games total that he started for the Saints. They had some talent there on offense, but I would argue that this collection of talent that he has in Denver right now, the skill positions, is the best group he's ever played with in the pros, well, that he's ever played with ever. So if the stars, Dave, are going to align for Teddy, all right, if the football fates have something like that in store, this is the year that it's going to happen, uh, you know, football God's willing. Let me say this off the bat. I, I, my hand to God, guys, I hope Teddy Bridgewater, now that he's the starter, plays every snap of every game and wins every game. But if he misses a game due to injury, I want the same vitriol as it would be levied upon Drew Locke in the same scenario. In terms of Teddy Bridgewater, yeah. I mean, we said the same thing, though, about pretty much every quarterback in recent times, including uh, Joe Flacco. Best skill position he's ever had. You know, it should translate to a career renaissance. It doesn't always work that way. And you have to ask yourself two things, Chad, okay? Is Teddy Bridgewater as a quarterback, is he capable physically of a renaissance-type year? What is his true capped potential in the NFL? Is he capable of throwing for 4,000 yards a year? And the Broncos win games with that method. And two, do the Broncos, and this is the biggest question that remains unanswered, and I think I have the answer, do the Broncos have the coaching staff that can help and, and progress and further along a Teddy Bridgewater renaissance here? I don't know about that. Everyone loves to talk about Teddy's time in New Orleans, him going 5-0. and No one talks about it was a Sean Payton coached offense. Yeah, his supporting cast, Kamara, Michael Thomas, the rest, but it was still Payton calling the plays, drawing the game plans up, and obvious guys, obviously, when you go from Sean Payton to Pat Shermer, that's a far cry. So, yes, with the personnel around him, this is the most talented team he's been on in quite a while, maybe ever, but I still think his own physical limitations will cap him, and more importantly, the coaching staff, Chad, the play calling and the game planning, Pat Shermer will hold him back as well. You really need that ground game to come alive now for the Denver Broncos, and because here's what's going to happen, guys. The check downs and the dink and dunk and the curl routes and the drag routes and all that stuff, defenses will get wise to that pretty quick, and they'll just start crowding that five to ten yards off the line of scrimmage and force Teddy to beat him over the top. And until he does that, you, he's going to be – it, it's at risk of being smothered. We'll see how it shakes out. Josh, thank you for the super. He says, Teddy is a glorified – Brian Greasy. I hope Locke becomes a Raider and the Broncos and burns the Broncos for the next 18 years. Time for a dink and dunk season. I I, I can't, I can't uh, endorse that Josh, but I feel that uh, I understand that you're upset and disappointed because look, here's the thing. This was something I was saying to uh, uh, my brother today. who was coming to me like truly like a football priest, like Chad, dude, man, I don't know about this. Like he was, you know, tormented right in his soul about what the Broncos decided to do today one of the things he said to me that stuck out was like, Teddy, look, he's a Bronco. I'm going to root for him. I'm down for Teddy. But Drew was our guy. And I said, what do you mean by that? He goes, well, you know, we drafted him. We developed him. All that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I, I feel you on that. I get that. Uh, but it's time to close ranks, guys. And don't, you know, don't throw hate. Don't throw, wish any anything, uh, don't wish any evil on Teddy, the Broncos, or anyone. That's just the way this cookie crumbled. Zach, real quick, an update on Facebook. Here's who's on the leaderboard for tonight's stream. Andrew Lampy at the top. Thank you, bro. Butch Butch, number two, love you. Zeus McPeak, love you, brother. Michael, love you. Leaf Roebuck, good to see you. Alexander, appreciate you. Mark Lindemood, Dave Glassman, uh, Shannon Mills, and Matt Martinez. Thank you guys for the support. Keep it coming. We'll uh, update again here in just a, a few minutes. But, Zach, before I get your reply, let me let me read this here from Christopher Gaspari up in Canada. Appreciate the support, Chris. He says, hey, guys, awesome pod as always. Teddy won't last four games. It will be Drew's team for the future. Hashtag let him hate. Hashtag state of being. We'll see, man. We'll see. If anything favors Teddy, it's the fact that it is a really soft schedule. The first quarter. And, you know, it's like today I talked to uh, one of the MHH Mount Rushmore superstars, Mark Langley, on the phone. And I said, look, man, I said that exact same thing. And I said, but the true test, I mean, every game's a test in the regular season. Don't get me wrong, Zach. But the true test is going to be, how does Teddy 
perform in the second quarter of the season. Because, yes, that first four games, hey, that stretch, it's a relatively soft schedule, and you got that going for you, but teams are going to get wise to you. And then the level of competition is going to go up a few notches the second quarter. It'll be interesting to see how he responds to that. I think no matter the quarterback, that was imperative for the Broncos to go on to have a 9-10, maybe 11-win type season. They have to beat the opponents they should beat. So that includes maybe New York, definitely Jacksonville, more than likely New York. Those are the first three games the Broncos have, and they should be 3-0 and on paper in those games. Uh, to the, I wanted to say, though, the last couple of points that we've been talking about with Bridgewater, don't wish, don't wish injury, don't project injury, don't put that bad karma out there, guys. He's still the Broncos quarterback right now, and it's team over player. It's country over party. That's how we have to look at it. No doubt about it. All right, I am really quick here because the stream's about to do a jump. So I'm looking through. Oh, and it just did it on YouTube as well. So I'm let me let me uh, let me scroll up here real quick. I might have to let's grab Kobe Ray real quick, Zach. If you'll grab him, I'm gonna look at some things yeah. on the back end because I know we've got D Dub, we've got Michaela, we've got a few people that have been waiting patiently. Yeah, appreciate you, Kobe. Four ninety nine super. We appreciate you having uh, you hopping in here tonight. He goes, we'll have. A couple explosive short plays this year, but nothing deep. DBs won't respect the deep pass game, and we won't have a run game. Go Broncos. They, You know, they will have a run game to start when no team has film on the Broncos, everything's fresh, and hopefully Pat Shermer, God willing, has some creative concepts. But, you know, Melvin Gordon, you have Javante. Royce looks pretty good this summer. And then when Mike Boone comes back, they should have a pretty lethal ground game. The trouble starts, though, when defenses adjust and they have some film and they start to counter that and they shut down the run. They stack the box. They shut down Javante and they force Teddy to beat them with his arm. They force Pat Shermer to beat them with his game planning. That's where the trouble lies. And you're not going to beat the Chiefs, you're not going to beat Justin Herbert, you're not going to beat even the Raiders by dinking it down four and five and six yards at a time. You're not going to win by death by a thousand paper cuts. You're going to have to take chances deep, push the ball down the field, and exploit the weapons that you have. It'd really be a shame for an offense that has Portland Sutton, Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler, Noah Fant, for them to throw three and four yard checkdowns every play and run, run, run the ball. So they have to open it up, Chad. They'll get by for a little while with their ground game, but eventually Teddy's going to have to take over. The chickens will come home to roost. And when they do, you got to have a plan for that. You know, do you have a chicken coop? It's right. like Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And that's exactly what the Broncos are going into this season with that same mindset. Okay, Zach. We got to go through some like true rapid fire because this might be the most active super chat night I've ever seen. And we've had some tent pole nights, some watershed nights here on, on the Huddle Up podcast. First, I want to shout out Dave Glassman, great supporter, great superstar. Appreciate you, bro. He says, My symbolic gesture with a $3.33 super chat. And then he says, Cheers, basically. Uh, and he's got the lock emoji. See y'all on Facebook. We really, really appreciate you, Dave. Um, and then Jonathan, now guys, tonight, let me just tell you, I'm not going to be able to flash every single super on the screen, but we will read every single super. All right. And we're going to have to do it. Let everyone, you know, unburden their souls, exercise the demons as many questions as we can get to. We will, but I'm gonna have to rapid fire this. And Jonathan, thank you for that. Extremely, extremely, wow, extremely generous super bro. He says, thank uh, I'm done with this coaching staff. The sad part is Drew is going to go ball out for another team. Like Drew said, if he does, for whatever reason, have to play this season, he'll surprise everyone. Vic was leaning Teddy the whole time. He could have saved time. And then Casey Nickel, to kind of piggyback off that real quick, and then I'll let you respond to these two great superstars, says, uh, and thank you, Casey. He says, Fangio went with the save his job pick, the safe pick. Either way, I'm going to support my Broncos no matter what. Let's go Teddy. How, you know, you can be the biggest Bridgewater fan or a lock hater alive. How can you dispute that the rationale in which Fangio made this de- decision was based around saving his own hide? saving his own job, extending his career, hopefully with the Broncos, and not inviting a pink slip next January. If you wanted the higher upside guy, that's Drew Locke. If you want to have a more explosive offense, that's with the Drew Locke uh, you know, quarterback offense. Always go with the ceiling. Then you have the floor to bail you out. 
And we talked about this multiple times. Throw Locke out there. See what you have. He did not fall on his face in preseason. He actually looks pretty good. He looks like he took a step forward in year three. Throw him out there. See what you have. And if nothing happens, if he doesn't progress, you lose a game or two, you always have Teddy, who has been a backup who doesn't mind being a backup and probably is better suited to be a backup. So yeah, this was purely again not a Fangio call or a patch or excuse me, Peyton call, Pat Shermer call. This was a Vic Fangio call all the way and that's why to me it's completely unsurprising. It just surprises me, man, because you know, it reminds me of uh family members I had that when the economy crashed coming out of the George Bush era and going into the Barack Obama era. They panicked when they saw the stock market going down and they had worked for 30, 50, 40 years to save money and put money in their 401k and all that. So you understand the fear. They've invested a lot. They've sacrificed a lot, right? Everyone around them in our family was saying, hey, I know you want to panic. Don't pull it out. It's going to bounce back because they had lost like 30% of their, their money at this point, right? I'm not going to go into too much detail, but everyone said, no, write it out, write it out. But they panicked and they pulled the plug and they took the money out because they didn't want to risk losing any more of it, right? I get that. Then what happened? Within three or four years, not only did the market bounce back and they would have not only made back the money they lost, Zach, but the money they pulled out would have gone on to make them a lot more money. And so in this case right now, the Broncos are the exact same as those family members I just referenced, all right? They put in the time. They made the investment. They worked. They traded their time for dollars. They socked it away. And when the market was starting to give them a little bit of fear and they're starting to see some losses pile up, instead of recognizing that those sacrifices and the money and all that in the long run, in the long term, was for the good and stay the course, ride it out, Broncos panicked and pulled the plug. And just like those people in my family I mentioned, they will pay the price for that. Robot of Doom 5, real quick, Zach, for my QB, Drew Locke, I'm heartbroken by this, seeing Locke talk about it broke me. I see a lot of myself in him. Um, someone who wants to succeed. Hashtag my QB three, Zach. You know, I got to say, I'm sure in the building behind the scenes, you know, Peyton, this is his own team. He's fully in charge. I mean, he gets to buy the groceries and make the, the final decisions uh, on personnel, on certain players and this and that. But if if Elway was giving his input to George Payton, which we kind of know that he's doing maybe a little bit offhand, maybe just as a friend, if not a professional, you, you think that would have swayed Payton to step in and say, listen, we don't want another Band-Aid type season. If there's one person in the building, not Fangio, not George Payton, that lived through retread after retread, uh, underwhelming quarterback after underwhelming quarterback, that's John Elway. So you think he would have stepped in there and said, listen, maybe let's go with Locke to start out just to see what you have, and then you can come in with the retread. So th- to me, it lends more credence that it was all Vic-, Vic Fangio's call. No doubt about it. I have zero doubt. And Teddy was a Peyton guy. Like Teddy, you know, that deal was executed by George Payton. He was part of the staff that drafted Teddy back in Minnesota in 2014. But I agree. I think this decision was heavily influenced and obviously made by Vic. And it was influenced, I think, ultimately. The rationale was more out of fear of loss than hope of gain. Rathman, hey, thank you for that super chat, my friend. It means a lot to us. Uh, stick around. Connect on Twitter. Welcome to the to the manger, my friend. Appreciate you. And then, Zach, here's another newbie. Wade Kimball, thank you, my friend. Appreciate Welcome, that Wade. very generous super. He says, I'm new to MHH, and it's my first super chat. Salute. If Teddy won with uh, – if Teddy Bridgewater won Tampa with – Tampa Bay, I think. Brad Johnson. Tampa, oh, yeah. Hello. Thank you. Man, all these – thank you. If Tampa Bay won with Brad Johnson, Baltimore with Dilfer and Flacco and, and Manning in 15, then we will be okay. I always said defense wins championships unless the QB throws it. I feel you, but don't get too out over your skis right. with that particular ethos, okay. Wade, because – John Elway fooled himself into thinking for five years. I'm one quarter. I'm one middle of the road quarterback away from winning it all because our defense is stacked to the gills. It's a very flawed philosophy, and it only bears fruit for a team if maybe once a decade. That's it. Most of the Super Bowls that are won, Wade, are won with a franchise guy, including that Peyton one. And even including the Flacco one, like, look, I'm not trying to 
make Flacco out to be more than he was, but he was that, that team's franchise quarterback for a decade. Now, Dilfer, I'm with you. Johnson, yeah, I get it, right? But you don't fool yourself into thinking that this is a team so good and just chomping at the bit to go out and dominate the league that they're one middle-of-the-road quarterback away from doing what you're talking about here. Well, it can be done. You know, it's very rare. But in order to do that the way that Tampa did it, Baltimore did it, Denver did it, you don't just have to have a good defense or a very good defense or even a great defense. You have to have an all-time historically uh, lasting defense. That's what you have to have. And those are exceedingly rare. You get them, like Chad was saying, what, once about a decade, 2015, uh, you know, 2002, you know, early two. And other than that, though, that they're very, very rare. So you have to ask yourself, the Broncos defense on paper, they're going to be very, very good, maybe even the best ranked defense in the NFL. But can they be historically good, all-time good? I don't know. Not with – I'm sorry, not with the coaching staff. D-Dub is in the house. Dale, from across the placid and beautiful Pacific Ocean in Hawaii – jumping in with a baller super chat as he is wont to do. And Dale, we are seriously stoked to meet you September 26th in Denver outside the stadium, as well as so many of our superstars and community members and supporters. So love you, dude. Appreciate it. He says, I'm on the lock train and think this is the wrong decision, but I got no tears for Drew. At this point, he can really use this to drive him or he can eat sour grapes. I'm really hoping he decides he won't ever lose a QB competition again. Broncos for life. I like the way you phrase that, bro. I think it's the wrong call, but I've got no tears for Drew. I do. I feel you on that. I might have one little like crocodile one because I do think there were some factors here that were outside his control. Um, but Drew had his opportunity to get a full season without any threat to his job as the understood quarterback last year. And in those scenarios, Zach, your opportunity is finite, right? In the league, you have to go out there and leave no doubt. And his performance, although there were some notable moments, plenty of doubt was left on the table. My counter, though, and I ask you as well, Chad, did Teddy Bridgewater leave no doubt this preseason? I don't think he did. I think he left no. a little doubt as to how good he can be or, or if, is he that much better than Drew Locke. So we're always going to have the double standard. Again, it reminds me a, a lot of the political landscape around the country right now. Everyone is dug into their side. I feel bad a little bit for Drew Locke, the person. I mean, this is still a young 20-something guy. This is one of the hardest moments he'll ever have to go through in his entire life. And he got up there and he handled the tough questions and he showed a lot of fortitude. And I give him credit for that, but I'm not crying for him. I'm moving forward with Teddy Bridgewater as a starting quarterback because the season's not over. The season's just starting. And we happen to think there's going to be a lot of exciting moments and maybe a lot of exciting victories in Denver this year. All right, let's grab this one from Suffering Broncos fan, another new name. So welcome. Thank you for that super chat. Connect with us on Twitter. We'll uh, keep the conversation going. He says, I'm sad to see Drew go down. Would have loved to watch him, <clears throat> pardon me, with his new improvements. But that's life. It's Teddy time. P.S. We need to draft a quarterback. Yes, Zach, indeed. If this yeah. does signal the end of the Drew Lock era as it does to me, I mean, unless, and another thing I've, I've talked about on this show, Every once in a while, the football gods will uh, pour out a blessing, a unique opportunity. But once a guy gets sat down, man, that's usually it for that team, right? I mean, go around the league, Andy Dalton in Cincinnati. I mean, you can it, – it's Wentz. just the way – Wentz, yes. It's just the way it goes. So every once in a blue moon, you know, there a, a guy will get sat down and then the guy they went with instead either sucks or gets hurt, and then he gets put back in and makes everyone regret doubting him. But it's so rare. It's so rare at the quarterback position in particular. But suffering Broncos fan, appreciate you. And then Jake Gerard, good to see you, bro. He says, boys, this is all part of the plan. Teddy, this year, four years of Aaron and then Arch Manning. 
Yeah, no, I, 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 it's got to be a rookie quarterback next year because the Broncos quarterback room is going to be completely remodeled after this season. You might not see any of Drew Locke, Teddy Bridgewater, or Brett Rippon on next year's roster unless Teddy just has a magical season. They might resign him to be a holdover or to start another year, but more than likely, no Aaron. I don't see that. I don't see Russell Wilson or Deshaun Watson. I see a first-round rookie quarterback the guy that uh, George Payton gets to handpick and maybe the new head coach gets to handpick as well. Zach, I need your help. I'm, a, I'm Real quick before we yeah. grab the veritable duchess of MHH, I need your help keeping an eye out while I'm juggling all the supers uh, and making sure we don't leave any super, uh, super chat superstar behind. As I flash these names of the stars Tonight, I want you to help me look for any of their comments or questions in the chat and just throw them up when you see them. Just throw them on the screen. Uh, Randy, here's the leaderboard tonight. Randy Jones at the top. Andrew Lampy, Brian Bowman, thank you guys. Butch, Zeus, love you. Michael, love you. Leaf, love you. Alexander, Mark, Dave Glassman, Shannon Mills. Thank you, Shannon. Matthew, Victor Marquez, Jay Helms, Melvin Paulson, Shulier Albert, and Travis Tarbox. Thanks, you guys. So, Zach, just remember those names if you can, and when you see one, throw it up, because I don't even have the stream, the, the comment stream in StreamYard open because I'm bouncing back and forth. Now, that being said, the Duchess weighs in. Michaela Parker. Thank you. Something profound. It's coming. Here we go. What is this? A political election? We will be worse off next year, in my opinion. Shake my head. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> here's, here's the thing, Zach. It's been so toxic you know, um, there's a there's a part of me that's like, you know what? Maybe it's for the best because how could Drew thrive in a in an environment that has been the way it's been for him around the uh, Mile High City? Fans being, uh, you know, divided and whatnot. Maybe it's for the best. Maybe, but it does sound like a political election, Michaela, when you're saying we'll be worse off next year, depending on your political uh, leanings, of course. But it's, it does, and that's what the whole country's become. It's, you know, again, I don't want to get too much into it. Left versus right, vaxxed versus unvaxxed, and everyone has their own stance. Meanwhile, we're all living in the same country, sharing the same country, and like the same point I made earlier, we're all watching the same team, covering the same team, or rooting for the same team. So it's, again, not Team Teddy, not Team Drew, not Team Fangio, Team Broncos, Michaela. And I promise you, they will be competitive this year, they'll win a lot of games this year, and it'll be okay. Okay, I promise. stop the presses, get your pencil, Notebook. Actually, not a pencil. Get a pen, all right? Nay, get a Sharpie. We got to repeat this again. It's not the first time we've said it. The Denver Broncos can win with Teddy Bridgewater. Teddy Bridgewater is no joke. We admire and respect Teddy Bridgewater as a quarterback. In fact, I have gushed about Teddy as the leader on, on this podcast ever since he walked through the doors when OTA started. Do we have our reservations about some of his uh, limitations and, and his upside? We'd be lying to you if we didn't admit that. But we still maintain the belief as co-hosts and the faces of this podcast, all right, that the Broncos can win with Teddy. But, Zach, my caveat to that is a lot has to go right, all right? Your defense does need to live up to expectations, your rushing attack needs to meet, if not exceed, expectations. Your offensive line needs to be better than it was last year. And your skill position guys need to stay healthy. That's a lot of ifs, ands, buts. They're not candy and nuts, or else we'd all have a Merry Christmas. Wait, the way I understand it, Chad, you mean it's not all on the quarterback in terms of the team's success? You mean there's more factors that go into it? Oh, okay, okay. I understand now. Anthony, what's good, buddy? Wanted Drew to be the quarterback. This team is ready to win now. If Teddy gives him the best chance at that, it is what it is. As long as this team is as good as I think it will be. Orange Crush says, thank you, by the way, again, Anthony, you man. Orange Crush 7, a name I don't really recognize in the chat as a superstar. So, hey, welcome. Thank you. Connect on Twitter. We'll keep the conversation going. If this is your first time super chatting the Huddle Up podcast or at Mile High Huddle on YouTube, Connect with Zach and myself and all of our social media channels because after every single podcast, we like to send out a thank you tweet tagging our superstars from that night's show and those who are starring on 
Facebook as well. So make sure you connect with us. Orange Crush says, if it was close, we should have started lock because you can always go to Teddy. My biggest worry is the competence of the coaches. Yes. I hate Fangio and Shermer's play not to lose mindset. Thank you. Thank you, Orange Crush. I don't know what your name is. I'm going to call you Orange Crush right now because I I truly agree with every word you said there. Talent-wise, far and away, uh, the most up highest upside, most talented team, floor and ceiling that they've had since SB50, since Peyton Manning hung up his cleats. The only mitigating factor, even including quarterback, that can change that or hamper that, limit it, or maybe even torpedo it, is the coaching staff. And a lot of people are saying, well, at least Vic's a defensive mastermind, but I question that much as well. He's a really, really, really good coordinator, but a mastermind? Is he the, the defensive version of Bill Walsh? I have my reservations. We saw last year there were multiple instances where it was his defense or his coaching that caused the Broncos to lose, not their quarterbacking. So I am right there with you. On paper, this team, including Teddy at quarterback, they can win 11, maybe even 12 games. All things break correctly. But the coaching staff is going to make or break that. They can win 12 or they can win 8. Here's John Houston. Thank you, John. We appreciate you, my friend. You are a consistent superstar supporting MHH. Just about every night. He says, I've never been more disappointed as a fan. The years of this team making the same bad decisions is insulting to the fans. Not ever trying to draft and develop a young QB. And then it cuts off, but he says, um, uh, getting, uh, not ever trying to draft and develop a young QB, uh, getting failed retread quarterbacks. Yeah, that's the thing that surprises me. And that's what, uh, just really emphasizes that Peyton was true to his word and Fangio made this decision, Zach, is, you know, the old mentality, you could almost understand this because even Elway, like he wasn't patient enough to really give it a go with Paxton. He campaigned with Kubiak to get him reps and that ended up, of course, souring the relationship and Kub stepped down and all that. But at any point, Zach, John Elway could have stepped in and told Vance Joseph, no, you're going to start Paxton. He's our guy. Let the chips fall. He didn't do that because, again, he had deluded himself because of the team's success in 2015 into the belief that the Broncos were one middle-of-the-road quarterback away from winning it all. And so you get these facades at quarterback, these shell 50-50 competitions. And on that note, Zach, as I grab here, uh, Jelly as well. Thank you, Jelly. He says at the Titans – uh, they let wide receivers and running backs do the talking. I feel you. Um, on that hey, note, it's... <laughs> yes, indeed. And now I forgot what I was going to say, but nevertheless, look, um, I thought I thought the mentality had changed, Zach, yeah. with Elway, moving on to Peyton. So but it doesn't really feel like it has now, right? We're repeating the same patterns of head meet wall. Yeah, and again, it's it's a really it's a really difficult position for George Payton to be in. He's a rookie GM. He wants to give Fangio the leash to let him pick his own quarterback and to be empowered. And there's a mutual respect there. That's why he kept him as the head coach. But also, he has to look at what's best for the roster. And there were rumors out there, not necessarily that I believe them, rumors that indicated the front office wanted Drew Locke and the coaching staff, Vic Fangio, wanted Teddy Bridgewater a difference of opinion at the most important position. It tends to happen, though, when you foist a first-year GM uh, on an embattled lame duck head coach. It's really not a great pairing historically. It's Exactly, and that's something that fans need to recognize is there was a downside risk to the Broncos not giving Peyton a true clean slate and allowing him to pick his head coach, and that is, you know, seeing eye to eye 100% with the philosophies and outlook – And also, not only that, Zach, but like, who's in charge, right? Whose team is this? Is this George Payton's team or is this Vic Fangio's team? Right. Because on a normal squad, the GM, it's it's like, have you ever seen um, uh, Moneyball, right? About the baseball movie, all that, the analytics and Brad Pitt and all that. Well, there is a scene in there where he goes in and steps in and gets in the manager's face or the AKA head coach and says, no, you're going to play Pena. And he says, no, I'm not. And you can't make me because I'm the manager and I'm the one that's out there on the field on game day. You can't make me. And so 
they kind of have a standoff. And so he gets the idea, well, I'm just going to trade that dude then. And then you'll have to start the guy I wanted you to start. The GM is the boss is my point here, Zach, but, but on well-run teams that are successful across any pro sports, uh, land, the whole pro sports landscape, there is a shared ethos. There is a shared philosophy, right? An outlook. And even though, Peyton and Fangio have said all the right things from day one that they share, that they're on the same page. Today's decision with Teddy makes me question it a little bit because a GM has to think long-term. Yes, you got to win in the now because it is the not-for-long league, right? But you also have to protect, secure, bolster your long-term outlook. And today's move was the exact opposite of that. It was all about the short-term. Well, the, 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 the connections that work out the best when you have a head coach and GM, when you have that camaraderie and when it works best and no power vacuum, no butting heads, it's just a true one-to-one connection. Those head coaches and GMs, um, t- kind of like Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith in Atlanta, they tend to get hired together. So they're coming at the same time. They have the same experience or lack thereof with the organization and they get to start out from scratch and not get foisted upon one or the other. But if you watch a team, if anyone's watched Hard Knocks, there is no discussion or doubt or dispute at all who's calling the shots for Dallas. That would be Jerry Jones, the GM, not Mike McCarthy, the head coach. So, Chad, you bring up a good point here. Whose team is this? For 2021, while he's still in power as head coach, is he making the calls? Is he pulling the strings behind the scenes, or is it George Payton? I think that's a question that we have to answer. Trevor says, hey, guys, I'm a Broncos fan no matter who the QB is. My point this is this. I wanted Fields in the draft, but when that didn't happen, I said, this is my team. I'll cheer for them no matter who the QB is. Cheer on Teddy. Cheer on the Broncos. Denver Broncos for life. I understand that uh, ethos. I very much do. And then, uh, Zach, here's Randy Foster on Super Chat. Always root for, the, for Denver above all else. It's hard for me to get behind Fangio's decision. Hopefully, Teddy balls out. Pumped for September 12th. That's the season opener. But especially to meet y'all. That's you as well. September 26th. Yes. Can't wait. Uh, James Boyd, good to see you, buddy. Thank you. He says, I'm juiced to be done with it. Yeah, there is a relief that it's over, regardless of how it came out. Like, you know, it's like being in a custody battle or something. You're like, man, I just can't. <laughs> you want this. You want to win or whatever. But, like, you're just like, I can't wait for this to be over. It's a relief when when it's when it's over. Uh I hope Locke still puts in the work to figure it out. So Locke starts week five or what? Only if, if Teddy falls flat or gets hurt. And let's not anyone wish for that. You just got to let the chips fall how they're going to fall. And if it's meant to be for Drew, it, he'll find his way to the field. And as he said at the podium today, you know, prove his doubters wrong, including obviously his coaches. You have to wonder, though, how long is Teddy Bridgewater's leash going to be? You know, is it going to be longer than Drew Locke's leash would have been? Is, is it, How many bad games does Teddy get before he's considered to be taken out, to be benched? How many interceptions does he have to throw, if any, for him to be removed from the game? I still think he's going to start every game, barring injury. I think the coaching staff has made their choice. They have their line in the sand now, Chad. And like you said before, you can't put the toothpaste back in the in the toothpaste bottle. You can't put the cork back in the wine bottle. Once you signaled this to Locke that you're taking Teddy right now over him, that's it. That's a page turn that you can't turn back from. So I think Teddy starts barring his health. All right, Kevin Peterson, Big Kev, what's good, buddy? Long time OG superstar. He says, what y'all are overlooking is Kush at center. Move Graham Glasgow there, Natani Muti to right guard, and Bobby Massey at right tackle. By the way, Massey won the job. He's the starting right tackle. Uh, it doesn't matter who the quarterback is when our center sucks. Unfortunately, we hate to be the bearers of bad news, but despite an encouraging training camp, Zach, Lloyd Cushenberry, the film he's put on in the preseason has not been impressive. So I do wonder how long he's got to – they'll start him, I think, but – I think he's another guy that's on a relatively short leash, depending on the development and how quick the learning curve is of a Quinn Miners. I don't think the Broncos really want to flirt with moving Graham over. I think Graham stays at right guard. Could be wrong, but Lloyd is very much, I think, under the microscope. He'll win the job. He'll get the job, but I think he'll be on a short leash. 
this might be one of the the rare things that we disagree on. I think Cushenberry was shown, you know, decent progress. He put on some weight, and I think he'll he'll be a solid mainstay at center. He won't might not be an All Pro, but they might not need that. I, I wouldn't do too much messing around because who's going to play center? Is Graham Glasgow a better option? Uh, Quinn Miners isn't ready yet. Are you going to have Austin Schlotman take over at center? Cushenberry is the best choice right now, and we have to have faith that Mike Munchak can have the Garrett Bowles effect take over. Uh, Corey H. What's up, buddy? Thank you for the super. He says, I understand that most are upset. What I don't understand, <clears throat> pardon me, is making the connection that uh, this decision means Fangio is in trouble. Vic chose the guy his boss hired. Everyone get that? Smart move when you piece it all together. Um, I, I understand what you're trying to say, Corey. Um, but do you dispute? Let's pretend there wasn't a quarterback battle at all. Let's say Teddy arrived here and was immediately named the starter. He's our guy. That's why we traded for him. Would you dispute that Vic Fangio is one of the top coaches in the NFL on the hot seat? He is. Let me remind you. Vance Joseph won five games year one, six games year two. What's that add up to? 11 wins. Vic Fangio won seven games year one, five games year two. What's that add up to? One more barely than Vance. You don't think he's under the gun? You don't think that that's not, especially with the ushering in of a new GM who did not hire him? Right. You don't think Vic Fangio is very much motivated? I mean, every head coach is motivated to win now. Don't get me wrong. But Fangio in particular is one of a, a handful of coaches in this league that are under an unspoken edict of win or you're gone. And I think, you know, would add, I think Peyton is not only aware that Vic Fangio is coaching for his job, I think he kind of geared it for that to happen. Look at the Patrick Sertan pick. If it truly was Sertan over Fields or Mac Jones, he was giving Vic Fangio the benefit of the doubt. He was giving Vic Fangio another toy that he arguably didn't need. They brought in Ronald Dar- Darby. They have they brought in Kyle Fuller. They had Bryce Callahan. They used a third under corner last year, and they take a corner over a quarterback in round one. I think that was another Vic Fangio geared move. So whether it was Locke or Teddy, there is no disputing. A, a coach that, like you said, Chad's won that many games in two years. This on paper roster is so talented that to me, if you fall short of the playoffs, you deserve to get canned. You don't have a lifetime in the NFL anymore. You don't have this time to set up shop for three or five years to instill your culture. You have to win right away. It's what have you done for me lately? And like you mentioned, George Payton has zero emotional investment in Vic Fangio. He wants his own guy in the building and he might get that chance as soon as next year. No one's on scholarship in the NFL. And in fact, the closest thing approaching that is draft pedigree. And for those guys, you know, it's also a finite thing. You got about a three to four window if you're a high round draft pick to make hay. And I mean, even in Denver's case, first round pick Paxton Lynch, gone. Didn't even get year three, right? So no one's on scholarship in the league. It's put up or shut up. Muhammad Badri, legendary superstar. What's up, bro? Says the dragon is on fire. Yes, he is. Appreciate you, brother. Uh, I'm going to run through a a couple of them real quick here, Zach. Michael Carmelini, good to see you, brother. Appreciate the super. Have one on me, boys. Drew should have gotten another year. This too shall pass. Teddy Bridgewater is a good QB. That's one of my favorite phrases. Um, I think it's from the Bible. I think it's New Testament. Either way, this too shall pass. Thank you, Michael. Mr. Ranch, when will the Broncos step up as an organization instead of placing the problems on the players, lacking leaders and accountability at the top? And then last one here, Zach, to be caught up for a second. Suffering Broncos fan says, it's simple. Start Drew and have Teddy back him up. What's your response to what Ranch here says, though, uh, as far as uh, the, the, uh, the organization lacking leadership and accountability at the top? Well, let's look at the organization realistically, okay? They have a rookie general manager. They have a lame duck head coach. They have a CEO who is on his way out, and they have no ownership right now. They have an ownership custody battle going on. So there is no leadership to have accountability from. 
So that's why I think in this period, it kind of worked out to where Vic Fangio, Chad, amassed more power than he would have in a normal circumstance. If maybe Pat Bolden was around or the Broncos had an owner, I don't think there would be checks and balances to Vic Fangio's decisions, to his performances, to his coaching, and they don't have that right now. And the one thing, again, I give him all the credit for being a defensive Not a mastermind, but a really good defensive play caller, but he lacked accountability in his press conferences. He lacked accountability when his defense or his coaching or his player that he picked or didn't pick lost the Broncos a game. So I've noticed that as well. And that's why we've been saying, yeah, Drew Locke is on the hot seat. Teddy's on the hot seat. These players are on the hot seat. But the coaching staff, the seat under their butts right now, Chad, is on fire as it should be. Shout out to Brian Bowman. Appreciate you, my friend. Uh, Shout out to Dave Glassman for the stars. First three look easy. Week four, not so much. Yeah, week four, it starts stiffening a little bit, no doubt. But it's that second quarter of the season, man. Like, if if in quarter one of the year you can go three and one, let's say you lose that week four, but you win, you know, your first three games, you're in business. But that next stretch of games, dude, like, it's it's pretty formidable. Uh, we don't have very much time because we're already over an hour, Zach, to go through schedule right now. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and read through a few supers to to get caught up. Um, starting with uh, Zeus. Love you, Zeus. You know you're the man. Sorry that tonight's it's so hectic we can't flash every super on screen, but we're going to make sure we get to your, co- your comments and questions. Zeus says, like I always say, coaching will make or break the season. The talent is there. Coaching, coaching, coaching. Not a great start, in my opinion. This decision does have its implications on the wherewithal and competency of this coaching staff. Unfortunately, in our opinion, it's the implications are negative. But I hope we're wrong. I hope when Teddy's uh, cleats hit the grass and the Broncos get out there against the Giants week one, they're trucking people. You know, that they the defense plays well, Teddy plays well, the running game plays well, everything's moving. But and I think it will for a time. I think it will for a time. But when defenses start to adjust to the horizontal passing game, that's when you're going to see really whether or not the Broncos made the right call. Yeah, I, I love you, Stu, so much, man. You know, he he brought up that coaching, coaching, coaching. I, that was something that was born uh, in the in the Vance Joseph era, where you know it all came down to coaching. They can have the best players on the field, they can actually get good play from their quarterbacks, but if the coaching is lackluster, it's going to torpedo it all. And we saw that under VJ, and some instances we've seen it under uh, Vic Fangio. Never forget Chad the Minnesota game a few years ago where they were up what twenty nothing. At halftime, they lost that game. That was a Fangio-blown game. The season finale last year, Fangio-blown game. It all comes down to coaching. And it's not only bad enough that they chose an older defensive mind going against the green. Who is their offensive coordinator? The least inspiring coordinator in the NFL, bar none. Okay, Chris, thank you for the super chat. Connect on Twitter, he says. So this, to me, says... We should have drafted a quarterback. Now, because of our semi-favorable schedule and good defense, we have virtually no shot for a quarterback in 22. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think that's true. That The the jury's still out on um, how good this team actually is going to do. When, in the actual standings, jury's still out. Um, Zach, Stu Meat jumping in. Thank you, bro. He says, uh, MHH and Broncos country, giving everybody some props. Really appreciate the positivity, Stu. Uh, Doug Henninger says, and thank you for the super chat bummed for Locke, but I will support Teddy hashtag go Broncos. And then Gizmo the Saint. Let me repeat that Gizmo the Saint says, so what's the excuse for Teddy? If he goes one in three, Zach, in the first quarter of the season, there'll be, there'll be every excuse in the book possible. It was Pat Shermer. It was Teddy not having familiarity. It was the defense. I I mean, I I truly believe, considering the way it was geared toward him this entire summer, uh, that he's going to have a much larger leash than Drew Locke would have as the starter. And it seems to be that he's on, that Broncos country has his back as well. It's the same reason, Chad, when Teddy Bridgewater threw three picks in a training camp practice, you, it, you'd be hard-pressed. You'd have to search for that on Twitter to read about it. If Locke did that in practice, it would be headline news all over the place. And I have a feeling that same double standard is going to carry over into the regular season. 
Daniel, thank you for the super sticker. Daniel uh, Claybrook really means a lot to us, my friend. Uh, Zach, I'm going to move forward to uh, Desert Creature. Thank you, Desert Creature. Several great quarterbacks had to leave their draft team in order to live up to their potential. I hope Drew leaves and finds a team that embraces him. Behind Teddy, as the Broncos cue, I'll enjoy this year. So, you know, one guy that comes to mind, Drew Brees. Similar to Drew Locke, second round pick. Now, this was back before the expansion, so technically, I think he was 32, if I'm not mistaken. He would have been a first round pick, but still, back then, first round or a second round pick, had some modest success with uh, the Chargers. In fact, I read his biography; it was a very interesting book, and uh, you know, got to the playoffs a couple times, made a Pro Bowl. Didn't work out though. They chose to not only you know they didn't draft Philip Rivers, they drafted Eli Manning, but cut that deal, bring in Philip Rivers. Spelled doom, ultimately, for Drew. He went on to have success elsewhere. But that same year, Zach, another guy who was let go by the team that drafted and developed him by the name of Dante Culpepper, he was looking for a new team. In fact, he beat out Drew Brees for the job. You know, not beat out, but, um, you know, he he landed the, the money from Miami Dolphins. Drew wanted to go to Miami first, but they ended up going with Dante Culpepper. Does anybody remember what happened to Dante? After he left Minnesota, it's nothing good. Drew Brees is one of those rare exceptions. Peyton Manning, another rare exception, where the team that drafted him, developed him, they had some success, even if they don't have success. The next team they go to, they knock it out of the park. It's rare, man. Peyton Manning's a Hall of Famer. Drew Brees is going to be a Hall of Famer. It doesn't happen very often, guys, so don't get your hopes up on that. Um and then, Zach, one more from Randy Foster says, it seems like the team hasn't learned from Keenum and Flacco. It's like a broken record. Go Broncos regardless. Here's hoping Peyton knows more than us. I, I was going to say Rivers, too. I mean, he had decent success, I, I would say, with the Colts for one year. But you're right. It, it's really rare that they will go on to have a, a really solid second stint. I mean, I was thinking of even McNabb after Philadelphia when he went to Washington and he just, you know, he fell off the map. So uh, that tends to happen. I agree with that. Okay, here we go. James Boyd. Thank you, buddy. He says, much love, fellas. Best channel I know. Hey, appreciate you. you. Facebook unmatched. Uh, Thank you very much for the content. Hey, thank you, James. Swag Nation says, Locke was robbed. This starting job in Seattle. uh, Locke was robbed of this starting job in that Seattle game. I've been a Broncos fan for 30 years. This is the worst coaching decision I've ever seen. I hope Locke asks for a trade and balls out elsewhere. Go lock and then Zach, as you reply to Swag Nation, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this one up on the on the screen because it's a very generous super from Seth Harmon. But um, do you think Drew is gonna ask for a trade? I think Fangio confirmed that's the route they're already exploring. I got a question on Twitter. Do you see Locke on the roster next next season? I think he could be off the roster by midseason this year. You know what Fangio said? He says a lot. You know, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, but I have no doubt that Drew Locke will have success as a starting quarterback in the NFL. That is a signal to me that he's <laughs> long for the Broncos' plans, and it signals to me that they may be looking to trade him. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, that kind of Vic gave it away there. So, yeah, I, I think um, he could be traded. And you know what, Chad? I think you're with me in the fact that no matter where he goes to next, depending on the coaching staff, I think he's going to have success. And we'll oh, see Locke get unlocked. The problem here, guys, is the season's about to start. There's only a few teams that truly are in need of a quarterback upgrade right this moment and that could afford to roll the dice like that, the Colts being one of them. Um, Trying to think anyone else off the top of my head. So it's one of those things that probably won't resolve. If Even if he does go and says, I want to trade, and the Broncos oblige, it's probably not a scenario that ultimately ends up resolving until probably right up against the trade deadline, to be frank with you. Um, Wow. Anthony. Yes, Seth, dude, seriously, That's that is amazing. so generous. We appreciate the support, my friend. Uh, this, uh, all of everyone's support, all right, guys? It allows us to keep showing up here every night, turn on the lights, turn on the camera, turn on the mic, and Thank tell you. you what we think about these very issues that we all care about so much, all right? We really appreciate you guys. And Seth, dude, seriously, that's just – thank you, bro. Thank you, Seth. Anthony Bomer says um, – and I just have to read this. Uh, he says – Oh, and Patrick Sertan, the the second, was still the right draft pick. Mark Hoynak, thank you for that super. Really does mean a lot. And then 
you know, we're going to have to do like some kind of a, uh, tell you what, for our Facebook supporters who we've, it's been really hard being able to get to the Facebook comments tonight. We'll do a, Zach and I will do a, a makeup episode for you guys only trust. All right. Trust on that. Corey H piggybacking off of the notion that, you know, Vic was just basically doing what his GM wanted him to do. And is he really on the hot seat and all that stuff? But guys, is Peyton going to fire Vic at the end of the year and say what? Nothing about the QB that he brought in. He didn't get Stafford, no Rodgers. He chose Teddy. Peyton can't just avoid all blame. Let me go first real quick. I would say that if Fangio, if he got to make the decision, I have a feeling he was involved in the quarterback acquisition decision-making process as well. So it can't work both ways. You can't exonerate Vic Fangio for naming Bridgewater the starter and then put Bridgewater's acquisition purely on George Payton. Vic Fangio had a hand in it all. And let me tell you something, no matter what, no matter if it was Locke or Teddy, if he doesn't cut it this year, Vic, if with this roster, you don't win nine games, you don't make a playoff push at the very, very least, he deserves to get fired, Corey. I hate to break that to you. Look, the GM, if this team has a bad year, the GM shares complicity in it, no doubt. But that's not going to save Vic Fangio, dog, regardless of who's under center. It's just not. Uh, Black Knight says, there was so much salt from this episode, I can open up a salt <laughs> mine and call it Bronco fan base tears. Touche. Yeah, yeah. We'll put it, we'll put it next to Red Rocks. Here's here's one of our supporters on Facebook with the stars. This is by far the best Broncos pod. Thank you, buddy. No doubt. Just sad to see everyone attacking each other. Denver Broncos for life. Yeah, let's not attack, guys. The decision's been made. Let's put the vitriol, let's put the division, let's put the toxicity in the rearview mirror. All right. And focus on moving forward and rallying and closing ranks around Teddy Bridgewater and hoping for the best. We want to see the Broncos have success after five long years of missing the playoffs, yeah. all right? And it's only going to be easier on the team to get that done if the fans are united behind whoever is under center, all right? Dennis Woods, love you, buddy. He says, Shermer was Teddy Bridgewater's OC in Minnesota. Don't you think Vic checked with him on the decision and was maybe swayed a little by Shermer? Shermer absolutely played a role in this decision. Uh, and Vic Fangio has been telling us that he's talking to the coaches, the offensive guys that are dealing with the quarterbacks uh, on a daily basis. They're talking about this. And so you don't think Vic's decision, although it was probably ultimately made in the spirit of self-preservation, Zach, it guaranteed Pat Shermer influenced that because he also is trying to save a job. Same with Mike Shula. Although I'd love to be a fly on the wall and know how Mike Shula felt about this whole thing. Cause he's the guy that's actually in every meeting with Drew and Teddy Every rep, every position drill from team to, to individual period. I would I'd love to know that. I still would love to see Mike Shula call plays for Drew Locke and see if that made a difference. I'm right there with you. Again, th this is the most maddening thing. Not that Locke is not starting. It's what could have been if he was starting. We will never know these answers, and that is very maddening. Okay, real quick. I'm just checking the back end. We're going to do an update on uh... – on Facebook. All right, we got a few that I'm going to have to read rapid fire when we come out of this, but here's an update on the stars tonight, guys. Thank you so much for the support. You're moving up the, the leaderboards. We'll update that tomorrow night at the beginning of the show. Randy, love you. Andrew, Brian, Andrew Baker, Howie, Butch, Michael, Leaf, Alexander, Mark, John, Dave, Shannon, Brad. I mean, look at this list of names. Matthew, Jay, Travis Weber, um, Melvin, Shulier, Travis Tarbox. Thank you guys. And like I said, we haven't been able to get as many Facebook comments and questions tonight as we normally would. So we will find a way to make that up to you, even if it is a bonus episode for Facebook. All right. Trust on that. Okay, Zach, we got to do some rapid fires because I got to get going here. Yep. Um, first of all, wow, there's a lot that, that we haven't been able to get to yet. I'm dialing it back to... This is super rapid fire time, guys. Okay, Chris Vandeford. So this, to me, says we should... Nope, got that one. Sorry. Uh, Chaos the Lazy Monarch. I hate this decision. Should have let three start. Should have let Drew start the first four to six games to see if he's the guy. If he failed, we could have brought, brought in uh, Bridgewater. No doubt. Hashtag go Broncos. Drew could have always gone to Teddy. Uh, Team Jokic, good to see you, Christian. He says, an old superstar here, boys. 
Long time no see. It's great to have you back, brother. He says, this decision was so selfish by Vic. As Zach said, Fanjo is the most lame duck head coach uh, as it gets, so he wants to scratch and claw for his job. Hashtag let Fangio hate. Well said, James. <laughs> Uh, Cal E C says, uh, it's a super sticker with, or maybe it's not. Yeah, it is a super sticker with big old, like smiley face with the tongue hanging out. Appreciate you, James. Luis Kano, Zach, massively disappointed about Locke trying to be upbeat about Teddy's prospects. Can we be hopeful with the notion that Teddy has never had these kind of weapons before and will shed the check down label real quick, Zach, your thoughts on that. Can he be, you know, what what's the question? Are we going to be worried that he's going to shed the journeyman label, or is there is there a real chance that <clears throat> with all these weapons, he can shed that check down label? Well, what did he show in the first two games that would dispute that? He had some nice downfield throws, but the one he had to KJ Hamler, I mean, you can argue it was a back shoulder attempt, but it seemed a little underthrown. He just doesn't have that arm talent, and I think the check down mindset is not just Teddy Bridgewater. That's what Vic Fangio wants, and that's what Pat Shermer wants. They want a safe brand of football that's going to keep the Broncos in games, take the pressure off Pat Shermer, and make Vic Fangio's defense look like the hero. I don't think that he has to shed that label, Chad. He has to just be Teddy Bridgewater, and as long as he is that, he will be the Broncos' starter. Naj, what's up, dude? I'm able to grab yours on screen. He says, hey, bros, a, a bottom five offensive coordinator, bottom five special teams, and a bottom five head coach brought back for continuity. That's true. How is the continuity serving you now, guys, that it's not Drew? Now they have a top five roster, minus quarterback. Definitely don't like how this has been handled, but <clears throat> got to stay positive and hope for the best. I feel you on that, Naj. Zach, your reply while I get a couple things queued up. That's all we can do, but it's true. I mean, I thought they were bringing back Pat Shermer with the sole intention of giving Locke another year with that continuity, something that he hasn't had since Missouri, his sophomore year in college, in fact. And I thought that was the whole game plan. So again, something or someone stepped in there and disrupted that. There was a tangible shift, I feel, Chad, between preseason week one and preseason week two. I feel it. That's my own perception of that. Uh, here is Derek Wright. I don't know why we didn't make Teddy the starting cue from the jump. Let him get all the first team reps in practice. Let Drew play all and every preseason game. Yeah, if you were going to always go with Teddy, you wonder why, right? But uh, Broncos 87, and by the way, Derek, thank you for that $5 super chat. Broncos 87 with a $10 super chat saying, Mr. B is rolling in his grave. What self-respecting GM lets Vic decide the long-term future of this organization? What do you think Mr. B would say about the check down King and then Clado saying, we need to remember we are all on the same team here. On, and I honestly didn't care who won. I just want winning football again yes. for my Denver Broncos. That's what Mr. B would want. That's why he had the Mr. B standard of winning. And that's the Broncos have deviated so far from that, that again, it's team Broncos. No matter who the quarterback is, we all want the same thing for them, whether we cover them or whether we're fans watching them. We want them to be successful. We want them to be relevant. We want them to play Broncos football deep into January and just to celebrate that, to go back to living up to that standard. Okay. I think I found a way to do this, but it just, screwed me up where I was. So hold up now. Uh, wait, no, here we are there. There's the queen. <clears throat> Pardon me. She says, Christy in the house. Hey, love you, Christy. Thank you. She says, Hey guys, I'm pretty disappointed about Locke, but what makes it entirely bearable to handle, excuse me, but what makes it entirely unbearable to handle are the toxic fans that have taken over social media, wishing the best for our team QB included. Yes, indeed. The toxicity has been very difficult to handle throughout this. It's still pretty hot today, Zach, which surprises me because the resolution, it's over. Like the air's out of the balloon. Go ahead. I was just going to say uh, for anyone that feels that way, Christy included, I know you know this, but just take a step back from Twitter because it's not a healthy place to be in times like these. Brandon S., thank you for that super, my friend. Mark Langley, what is up, my friend? Good to see you. He says, what's up, guys? Hashtag politics. Hashtag, I'll just say BS. Got that right. Feel you. Christy, again, thank you. Thank you. The Queen says, on a much more exciting note, I got my flight for the tailgate awesome. in September. So excited to get awesome. to Denver and meet you all. Can't Let's wait. Let's go, Broncos. It's going to be so rad. Uh, Jay Ritchie, old school superstar. 
Good to see you, bro. He says, fellas, what happens now with Locke? Is this another quarterback competition next year if Teddy's average? Do we keep Locke? Hope that he starts next year. Uh, and then Matt P., thank you for that very generous wow, super, bro. Matt, thank you, buddy. Thank you. Uh, Locke, look, dude, unless Teddy craps the bed or gets hurt, Locke's time in Denver is done because mm-hmm. even if the Broncos have a middling season, miss the playoffs, and Teddy doesn't get re-signed, again, you can't put the the – toothpaste back in the tube broncos will draft a quarterback high next year in in that scenario all right they probably will regardless drew unless teddy loses the job mid-season and then drew goes in and plays well in relief of him he he just got his card just got pulled as far as his denver outlook uh christian again saying i love zach's passion uh for this so much and keep it up and then zach i'm gonna let you get a breath in here bradley dunton says my priests i'm disappointed hanging my number three jersey in the back of the closet. But Teddy's my guy now. Hashtag go Broncos. Hashtag MHH for life. Yeah, I appreciate all the love, guys. I want to add just one more thing about Peyton drafting a quarterback. I, we, we took one question earlier that said if the Broncos finish with a, a decent record, they might not be in range to get a quarterback. Well, if you guys wanted George Peyton to get Aaron Rodgers or Deshaun Watson, multiple first-round picks, what makes you think he won't do that for a rookie quarterback that he gets to scout, that he gets to handpick, that can be the cost controlled future of the organization? So, yeah, that's the most likely outcome, guys. A rookie taking over in 2022. Clayton Merrick, again, man, thank you, bro. I think that's your fifth super chat tonight. So, thank you very much, brother. He says, This reminds me of when Josh McDaniels traded Jay Cutler and Brandon Marshall. I was pissed off back then. Probably, I think he's talking about the energy and just trying to like wrap your brain around this. Uh, Michaela, the Duchess, again, thank you. Another great superstar. We can't wait to see. She says, Teddy completes. <laughs> what are you laughing at? The, her comment. Oh, co- Teddy completes three. Uh, <laughs> three yard pass, three yard pass, three yard pass, punt. <laughs> another three yard pass. Teddy completes another three yard pass, and we punt. LOL. Well, not unless Vic Fangio decides to do right. what he did in the preseason and give him fourth down every time. Um, Brandon, thank you for that. He says, my frustration comes from the fact the Broncos haven't taken a cue in the top 10 of the draft since 1979, 40-plus years ago. They keep treating this position as if it's optional with zero sense of urgency. And then uh, we get to uh, Willie Magoogle. Thank you, buddy. He says, "Uh, Chad, Zach, if this season goes south, does Fangio stay on as defensive coordinator? No. Also, Locke will get one more shot. We'll see, Willie. But no, that when Vic gets fired, he'll be fired. Yeah. And and for the people that are so disappointed, guys, don't check out of the season yet. I keep I can't stress this enough. Those who wanted Drew Locke, it's certainly disappointing. It, it's very deflating. It's it's a gut punch for your guy not getting in again, like going back to politics, but we have a season in front of us, guys, and we have a very talented roster that we're analyzing. And we think with Teddy, they're gonna win a lot of games still. So chin up. It's gonna be okay. Um, all right. So Colby, um, we'll grab you. I am Supreme. Don't worry. Uh, Colby, appreciate you being with us, my friend. Thank you for the stars as always. All right, Zach, I'm doing this one last time, share screen, and then we got to go guys. So so hold off on the supers. No more supers. Um, this is the last run real quick and it's got to be fast. Uh, I am Supreme. You demand long time listener, long time superstar Broncos starting QB Teddy two gloves. Let's go baby. So you got, I am Supreme is stoked. Uh, Cristobal, appreciate your brother. He says, so much for Cortland Sutton's return. He'll never see the ball. Everyone knows Steady Teddy's the safe play. Go Broncos still. I'm a Broncos fan before a Locke fan, and you should be. But, hey, Sutton's going to get plenty of work because Sutton's a slant king as well, and they're going to be running lots of slants with Teddy. Trust on that. Uh, David Kilgore, appreciate you, bro. Sorry, guys, just got in. What will happen to Locke now? Will we trade him? Uh, There's a decent chance of that, but we'll see, my friend. Uh, and then Zach Franklin Peterson says, in my humble opinion, any coach who compares any trait from Tom Brady, <laughs> this was a pretty obvious tell, and compares it to Teddy, uh, yeah. should have no input in picking the quarterback for this team. Go Broncos. Your final uh, comment to that, Zach, and then we'll we'll get on out of here. Well, you notice how there was no like pushback, no one questioning that comparison, Teddy to Tom Brady. But if that comparison, again, was made with Drew Locke being the other quarterback compared to Tom Brady, there would be a meltdown in the Mile High City. So that's going to always be the case. And we have to hope, because you know what, Chad? Winning does cure all. And I think the the lock, the sting of Locke not starting and the, and the sting of how – uh, the organizational mindset seems to be trending toward. I think if they start winning games, if they go three and zero 
to start September off, we're going to all be pretty happy. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. But yeah, when, when Vic said that and he made that comparison, you know, my instinct went up, my hackles went up, and I went, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, that was a pretty obvious tell. But again, we kept hearing, hey, Fangio's the one that's going to make this decision. <clears throat> Pardon me. And there was a part of me that was skeptical that that would honestly be true because the motivation there is pretty clear when it's so close, right? Um, oh, no, we suck again, Major League. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's the final tally on, on Facebook, guys. Thank you so much. We are going to make it up to you if we weren't able to get to your comments and questions tonight. Trust Randy Jones finishes at the top tonight. Andrew Lampy. Brian Bowman, Andrew Baker, Howie Frickin' Day, Butch Butch, Michael Ronquillo, Leif Roebuck, Alexander Emmert, Mark Lindemood, John Baker, Dave Glassman, Shannon Mills, Brad Murdoch, Matthew Martinez, Jay Helms, Travis Weber, Colby Collier, Melvin Paulson, Shulier, Albert. Thanks to each and every one of you. Thanks to all of our superstars tonight. If we missed your comment on Super Chat, if, for our Facebook supporters, we missed your stars. Understand, tonight was a very unique night. It was a true watershed stream. So just know that uh, we'll try and make it up to you. R feel free to reach out to us individually. DM us on social media, whether we're connected on Facebook or Twitter, and we will be available to you. All right? But we got to go for now. Zach, we'll be back tomorrow night for the Mile High Mailbag. But with that, sign us off, brother. Yes, sir, guys. In the meantime, before we see you tomorrow night for our last pod of this work week, be sure to follow the pod on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. You can follow the main account on Twitter for all your Broncos news, analysis, rumors, film breakdowns, and so much more. It's your one-stop shop for everything Broncos at Mile High Huddle. You can follow Chad on Twitter, as you can see, at Chad and Jensen. You can follow myself at Kelberman NFL. If you haven't already, go to HuddleUpPod.com and get your swag on. Uh, you can get a um, hat that Chad wearing you get t-shirts hoodies coffee cups everything and anything you can imagine is in that store also facebook.com slash mile high huddle you'll see a big blue button hit that become a supporter guys we have three vip shows right now kelberman's corner broncos book club and trickle zone uh more on the way with that we appreciate your patronage on that and facebook.com slash mile high huddle pod like that page and follow that page but as always before i choke to death live on camera. If you can't do any of those things, be sure to do these three things that take five seconds and help us grow more than anything else out there. Subscribe, like, and share this video and every video you see on the MHH channel. But that's going to do it again, guys, until tomorrow night. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.